how should we view the pioneers? Mm, this is an interesting question. But here's the point I want to make, uh, and this is something which I think is extremely important. We study the pioneers, brothers and sisters, because they help us to understand the process as to how we got the truth. And I think that's important. Uh, how, should we, how should we view the pioneers? Uh, again, a very important uh, understanding uh, about this matter because I think somewhere along the line, perhaps we've been advertently uh, over the years placed a, a lot more emphasis on the pioneers uh, in a way which could be misunderstood by some people, particularly the younger generation. We have to be very careful that we are not elevating them to a status of being inspired. We know they're not inspired. We know their writings are not to take the place of scripture, but they are a terrific adjunct to scripture, not a replacement. We should greatly respect the pioneers, but we should never worship them. You know, I think Brother Thomas and Brother Roberts would be absolutely horrified if they knew that we had elevated them to an unrealistic level in our lives. Uh, they would be probably the first to say, hey, what are you doing? Don't put us up there. We're just mere mortal men like you. Uh, we don't need to be placed in, in a realm or stratosphere that is unrealistic. So we need to be a little bit careful about that as well. Uh, they made mistakes. Um, you know, they, they were mortal men. They made errors of judgment in their personal lives. And they even wrote some things that weren't quite correct. And we'll just discuss some of those things as we go through. By the way, they did uh, correct those things throughout their, their time of, of writing, uh, but there were some areas even in prophecy that they did get wrong. So they're, they're the first to admit we're not inspired and we did get things wrong in some of the areas that we presented the truth. Um, we should never elevate these men above their work. And, and that's another very good comment, which I, I did pick that up from an external writing. We should never elevate the man above the work they achieved. And I think sometimes we get that around the wrong way and suddenly everything about the pioneers is just glowing and wonderful. They're beautiful men that they just couldn't do anything wrong. And we've forgotten really about the work that they achieved. It's the wrong way around. Yes, they did do some wonderful things in their lives, but it's the work that we appreciate and we appreciate them for conducting that particular work to give it to us. Now, you might be wondering why we chose Philippians chapter 2 for our reading uh, this evening. Well, uh, there is a, a reason for that, and we're going to go very quickly through Philippians chapter 2 to see why, in this particular chapter, we can see the need to hold into reputation those that are working on our behalf. Now, for example... Uh, you could see the life of Dr. Thomas and Robert Roberts in uh, verse 4 of, of chapter 2. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. You could not get two very good qualified men who forsook their own needs in life and looked out for the needs of others. They actually went out of their way to look out for the needs of others, particularly as we're dealing tonight with bro uh, Brother Thomas. He did that almost from the moment he found the truth. You couldn't stop the man. It was all about everybody else getting that message across to the point where he himself lost so much and I believe lost his life over it. He actually lost his life over it. Uh, when you get to verse 12, for example, it says... Um, uh, study or sort of work out your own salvation, the latter part of verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's exactly what Dr. Thomas did. And it took 15 years to work out his uh, salvation with a lot of fear and a lot of trembling. And I'll tell you what, there was an awful lot of trembling when he had to deal with Alexander Campbell, as we're going to see, God willing, in our next class. And then you get to verse 29. Now, I know verse 29 is speaking about Epaphroditus, but realistically, it can be speaking about anybody that's gone out of their way to serve the brethren, the brotherhood, the ecclesia. 
Receive them, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation. So we don't worship them, but we respect them for what they did. And in the next verse, again, you can almost see Dr. Thomas here, because for the work of Christ, and he's talking again of Epaphroditus, but look at this, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his own life. And I believe that Dr. Thomas died prematurely for the service of the truth, as again, we'll see that next week. So a couple of more points about um, the, uh, the pioneers. Uh, they were, I already said, not inspired. They made mistakes. For example, Brother Thomas actually said that Christ would return in 1866, and he put it in print, and he wrote that, and he put it out there for all to see. It was based on his understanding of the prophecies of Daniel, particularly at 1260 years and where the starting date was, and he came to the conclusion it was going to be 1866. Now, he was wrong, of course, we know that, and it's a bit of a lesson to us, isn't it, that we don't put things in writing, particularly as far as dates of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is concerned. We can say it's very near at hand, or as the Apostle Paul puts it, uh, we know the times and the seasons, all right? Just be very careful we don't start putting dates. And, and Dr. Thomas was new. He was the first one, first cab off the rank, so to speak, in studying all these prophecies. He got so excited about it, he put it out there, it's in writing, and he got greatly criticised for putting that into writing. So they're not inspired. Um, they were actually, um, some were, and particularly Dr. Thomas, was criticised for what we call plagiarism. That is, he copied other people's writings and he grabbed hold of you know, great pieces of writings from magazines and other books, collated it together, put it in his own writings and sold it under his own name. Not sold it, but gave it out and distributed it under his own name. Well, brothers and sisters, I think we're all guilty if that's the term plagiarism that we're going to look at at the moment. If that's what it is, we're all guilty of that. I mean, I hear good talks. I, there's no one's got copyright on, on giving talks on the truth. If I hear something good, I'm going to repeat it to you. And you might think it's my work, but somebody else's work. I think that goes on quite a bit. Now, Brother Thomas, in fairness to him, uh, when he did read something and he did copy it and he did put it in his own books and writings, he never, ever, ever did that until he had thoroughly checked everything that was going into print under his name. And there were met quite a few occasions where he would always put a footnote and tell you where he got that from. So there has been criticism about that and it's been a little bit unwarranted, we reckon, because don't forget the printing press was evolving all the time in this day and age. They didn't have online information. Everything was what you read. It was hard copy, it was paper. If he read something, he checked it and he would use it in a writing. But as far as doctrinal writings are concerned from the pioneers, particularly Dr. Thomas, who really was the one that found all these doctrines, as far as they are concerned, they were his. Sure, there were some other religions that believed similar things, but they were his findings after 15 years of study. They're original, they're not tainted at all with any accusations of plagiarism. Did this is a silly question, I know, because you're all going to say, of course he was. You know, did God work in the life of this man? Well, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, look at verse 13 of, of, uh, of, of Philippians 2. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God works in you, he works in me, he works in presidents. He works in prime ministers. He works in governments. He works with influential people. He works with old people, young people. He works with a multitude of people right across this globe to bring about his plan and purpose. And within the ecclesia, he does work with you and me. And there's no doubt that he worked with this man. No doubt whatsoever that he worked with this man. About the only picture I can find of Dr. Thomas when he was a younger one. I've, every now and again I flip the image so it looks like it's a, taken from a different angle, but it's actually the same person. Um, there's not a lot of pictures of, of Dr. Thomas. There's usually this one and one when he's got old and a big long grey uh, white beard. Uh, so it's, it's quite an interesting concept to know that you're only going to see a couple of pictures of the man as we go through these talks. 
Here's, uh, here's three questions. Did Dr. Thomas rediscover the truth? Did Dr. Thomas resurrect the truth? Did he revive the truth? Um, I've used those terms. You've probably used those terms. He rediscovered it. He resurrected it. He revived the truth. Uh, the answer to that is no. That's not, that's not true. He didn't, he didn't do any of those things. Because the moment you start using terms of uh, rediscover, resurrect, revive, you, you are inferring, in fact, that the truth was dead at the time John Thomas came onto the scene. And I don't believe for a moment that God has ever allowed the truth to completely be snuffed out at any time period since the apostles. I really don't. I really believe that God preserved a remnant throughout all the ages, right up to today, and that, that there was some people always have been alive that have had a basic fundamental of the saving truth of scripture. You know, it's quite interesting when you think about that comment there, it was Elijah that actually said in his day that he thought the truth was pretty well extinct. He even told God, he said, God, it's almost over. I'm the only one left. Out of all the hundreds of thousands of people, I, I only, and the only one that is left. And God said, no, no, Elijah. There's 7,000 more people just like you. You just don't know about them. And we don't know who is out there at the moment that has a basic fundamental grasp of the truth. Uh, so it's, um, it's, it is quite, quite an important understanding to know that the truth, I don't believe, has ever died out. Now, how then do we view Dr. Thomas? Dr. Thomas found the truth in his own personal life after exhaustive research. That's what he did. He found the truth. Didn't rediscover it, didn't revive it. That's inferring it's dead. He actually found it in his own personal life. Now you might say, well, so what's the big deal about Dr. Thomas? Someone else might have found it. Well, here is my comment. This is my personal um, understanding of how we can view the doctor. Here it is. Once he found it, he put what he found into gear and he put, to use a modern term that some of the young ones might know, the pedal to the metal and he wanted to share this with as many as possible. There's the difference. This, this was a very extraordinarily unique man that had the capabilities to be able to do that part of finding the truth. If the truth was, and I believe it was, was somewhere else in the world at the time, it was not being promoted into the world. It wasn't. This man did that. And we're going to have a look at some of the traits that he had that, that gave him the ability to be able to do exactly that comment there. Put it into gear. It was like a vehicle that could not be stopped. Once he found that truth after 15 years, it was like a, a, a vehicle that he put into gear and he was going to ride that through the then known, well, U USA and UK and promote the truth. That was the difference with this man and anybody else that may have had an understanding of the truth at the time of of Dr. Thomas. And the traits that he had served him so well in being able to fulfill that part of his life. You know, he basically poured fuel on that flickering light of the truth and exploded into enthusiasm and passion. And that's how I think we should see the work of this particular man. Uh, by the way, you'll notice we keep using the term in or using the term the truth. Um, can we just say right from the word go that the truth is not a Christadelphianism, it's not a Christadelphian saying. Uh, it's come under a little bit of an attack of recently saying, oh, you Christadelphians keep using the term the truth, you know, as if it's some exclusive tight little club that nobody else can get a look into unless, you know, they do certain things and so on. The word the truth is a scriptural term. 
And it's used quite a, a lot in the Bible. We're not going to go to that now, but you can make that your own study. You just find the words of the truth together and you'll find it is not just in the New Testament, it's in the Old Testament as well. Um, just out of curiosity, here's um, some people in the medieval times, the darkest moments in mankind's history that had basic fundamentals of the truth. Now, John Wycliffe, we all probably heard of him, lived from 1328 to 1384. He was one of the first to translate the, the Latin uh, Bible into English. Uh, he completely repudiated the Catholic Church and everything that it stood for and taught. He actually wrote that he claimed one of the most insidious of all doctrines was the doctrine that you go to hell for eternal torment and, and, hell, and, and persecution because that was the means the Catholic Church were using at the time to pressure people to join the church. And, and pretty well, I don't know what else he actually believed, but he starts off on a pretty good grounding. What about this character here, Sir Isaac Newton? Brother Thomas actually quotes from Sir Isaac Newton in some of his writings. And for him to do so, he must have realised that he had something of, of quality worth, worth uh, noting. And perhaps he had an understanding of the fundamentals of the truth. Certainly seems that way. Did you know that Sir Isaac Newton actually wrote more about Bible than he did on his scientific and mathematical research papers. He wrote more about the Bible. His Bible is actually in the Cambridge um, University. You can go and see it. Some that have gone to see it reckon that it's marked up almost from cover to cover. It's like a, as if there's a Christadelphian Bible student having marked it up. And they say if you read it and you can decipher the old sort of English language at the time, you would be forgiven for thinking it was a Christadelphian Bible. But there's what he believed. He, he didn't believe in the Trinity. He didn't believe in a supernatural devil. He did not believe in the immortal soul. He believed in the second coming of Christ to the earth and a kingdom on this earth. He was branded a heretic by the church, particularly, of course, the Catholic Church. And if they had had their way, they would have got Sir Isaac Newton. They would have burned him at the stake. But they didn't because he was held in such high reputation in, in England at the time. And and uh, therefore, they, they really, he was almost untouchable in that sense. But there's, there's a man that had some fundamentals of the truth. Perhaps we shouldn't be surprised if he's there at the judgment seat with us when we get there. So there's um, five distinct stages of the life of Dr. Thomas. We're only going to just deal with just a couple of little small areas this evening. Then we get the real full-on run next week, God willing. So uh, here they are up on the screen, early training as the son of a congregational minister, and he trains, though, to become a medical doctor. Uh, identification of important Bible teachings, bitter divide, eventually happened with the Campbellites. Then there's a period of retirement from strife. I never even knew about this until I had a look at Stephen's notes. Really quite interesting. Uh, there's a period of, of his time where legally he was silenced for about five or six years. Uh, there's a consolidation of these teachings into essential doctrines for saving faith, and then finally, there's a campaign to preach the truth that he'd found to as many as possible in the USA and the UK. And there's some dates there that you can put alongside those points. Now, we're only going to touch on one and a bit of those points this evening. And so let's get started. And. Uh, Hopefully we'll finish on time tonight. I'll make sure we do because my wife will be looking at me if I don't. Uh, okay, here's something we need to understand about the era that John Thomas was born into. Now, Pip, you made a very good point on um, Sunday night that we're all affected by the environment that we are brought up in or are born in. And that is so true, especially for John Thomas. The 1800s was a very special era as far as religion was concerned because it saw the start of what we call the restorationists or the non-conformists. Uh, that is, groups of religious people that started to think for themselves and they were pulling away from standard church teaching, Catholic church in particular. Uh, so basically there was the Catholic Church and there was the Presbyterian Church, the Church of England and the, the Church of Rome. That was the basic foundation that was going in the late, 17, the late 1700s into the early 1800s. And there were groups of people saying, whoa, hang on a second, I'm not so sure that what they're teaching is altogether right. And they were known as the Restorationists. 
The restoring back to first century belief. So here they are. Here's the movements. There's more of them, but I've just put the main ones up that were in particular the time of, of Brother Thomas. There was the Campbellites that started in 1811. There was the Plymouth. The Campbellites, by the way, became known as the Church of Christ later on. There was the Plymouth Brethren, who are still around today. I'm pretty certain. I'm, they are around. They? You can almost pick Plymouth Brethren when you see them at the shopping centres. They definitely stand out as looking a little different. And good luck to them to be able to be, do that. There is the uh, Mormons. Of course, we all know about the Mormons. have grown into a multi, multi, multi wealthy, huge religious organisation around the world. Second in wealth to the Catholic Church. Uh, there's Millerism uh, by William Miller, 1831, later to become known as the Seventh-day Adventists, also quite a big movement today, and, of course, the Christadelphians. So there they are. They're the, there are more, but they're the main restorationists at the time of Dr Thomas, and, of course, he's involved heavily with the, the Christadelphians. Now, they were starting to get traction, not in the UK, but in America, in the United States of America. And here's the point I want to make with this slide. Virtually every one of those other religions there adopted 90% plus of the false teachings of the churches that they wanted to separate from, except for one. One group and one group only completely separated from church teaching. The Christadelphians. Under the fierce determination of a man called John Thomas. And I think that's extremely important. So, where did it all begin? Well, it all began in this square here in 1805, 12th of April. It's still there today, Hoxton Square in London. John Thomas was born in Hoxton Square, 12th of April, 1805. Didn't quite look so flash back in 1805. Um, in fact, it was some very old, decrepit buildings. It wasn't a very rich area of London at all. His father was a, a, a preacher, wasn't terribly well paid. Uh, his mother was also deeply religious. They were Baptists. And John Thomas was the first child to be born. He ended up having four more brothers and two more sisters. One brother, one sister died when they were very young, which was commonplace in those times. Uh, and so it was a reasonably large family. Now, he was born here in this particular square, Hoxton Square. Um, the only doctor in the square had a building there. You can see on the left, his name was uh, Dr. James Parkinson. And it's more than likely, strongly inferred, that because he was the only doctor in Hoxton Square that he was involved in the delivery of John Thomas. Just an interesting note, uh, that same Dr James Parkinson discovered what is called shaking palsy. And he wrote a big article about shaking palsy, which was later renamed as Parkinson's disease after the doctor. So just a little bit of trivia. Uh, brief history of uh, John Thomas, and we'll keep this very brief. Um, uh, he was born in 1805. He died in 1871. His father was a Baptist minister. Uh, John Thomas was totally disinterested in the Bible as a young man. His mum and dad were actually hoping that he would follow his father, who was, by the way, the records tell us, and they found some congregational writings in some of the churches where he did teach, dating back to this time, talking about John Thomas Sr. And they actually said he was quite a fiery speaker. He was actually could capture the attention of the audience. He was well received by the congregation and, and his father and his mother were hoping that John Thomas Jr., their firstborn, was going to follow in the footsteps of their dad. Of course, that did eventually happen, didn't it? But John Thomas was going to follow not in his dad's teachings. He's going to take on board that same fiery manner in preaching the word, but it was going to be based on truth. But his early passion was to become a doctor. Uh, he wanted to be a top surgeon. Religion had no, he had no time for religion because there was no way he could devote energy and, and his mental faculties to, to the Bible when he wanted to be this surgeon. 
So uh, it's a good point actually to just note at this point in time that even though his father was a fiery Baptist preacher, he later on was baptised as a Christadelphian. So the doctor wanted to become a he wanted to become a he, he wanted to become a doctor. Have you ever noticed? I don't know if you've read Dr. Thomas's life and uh, works. You will notice that uh, Brother Roberts refers to the doctor, not just in that book, but right through many of the writings as Dr. Thomas, not Brother Thomas. You ever notice that? He's, and we still today call him Dr. Thomas. Why don't we call him Brother Thomas? Why didn't Robert Roberts call him Brother Thomas? Well, I don't profess to know the answer to that, except for this. It was actually quite good and it is today to be known as a doctor because it opens doors, all right? You ever see on the, you wish you could tick the box that says my name's Dr Mike Steele because instantly you're going to be upgraded from economy to probably business class. <laughs> if you're in business, you'll get upgraded. There's something about being a doctor that opens doors. Now, I'm not suggesting Dr Thomas was a proud man and said, you only address me as doctor. I'm not saying that at all. But it is very interesting that he's always referred to as the doctor, Dr Thomas, most occasions, not all occasions. And I think that it's probably likely that it was able to open doors for him in his preaching work. Town halls that he spoke to, all the places around US and, and uh, in the UK were bursting their doors with people, like opening them up and people just crowding in there because we're going to hear a doctor speak to us. So uh, he did do his medical training and he did actually become a doctor. So he commenced his training at the age of 15, left school and started training as a doctor at 15. Uh, he entered St Thomas Hospital at the age of 20. Uh, he received his uh, graduation certificate at the age of 23. He wrote a lot of medical papers. This, he was a prolific writer, not just for the truth, but just in his, his um, research for becoming a doctor. Uh, he enrolled as a member of the British College of Surgeons and he attended over 2,000 medical cases. He did gain his certificate. He once made a comment he said that his 13 years after leaving school, he was surrounded by medicines, test tubes and dead bodies. That was his comment. Medicine, test tubes and dead bodies. So what was it like to be both a doctor and a patient in the 1820s? Well, here's a comment about that particular era. This is before anaesthetic. This is, what the, this is the era the doctor was involved in, and he carried out surgery. It is hard to imagine, as a person living in the 21st century, agreeing to surgery without the hope of anaesthesia. And yet prior to the discovery of anaesthesia in 1846, so that's years before the doctor was practising, or years after, sorry, the doctor was practising, all surgeries from minor to major were performed on people who were wide awake, oftentimes held down on the operating table by men whose only job was to ignore the patient's pleas and screams and sobs so that the surgeon could do his job. I'm pretty happy I'm alive today. This is the environment, Pip, you were talking about, this is the environment that the doctor did his training and began to practice. You imagine going in for appendix operation or gallstones removed or an amputation due to gangrene and all of those things were done in that era and there's no anaesthetic available. And Dr Thomas, as he said, was involved in 2,000 of those types of operations. So Dr Thomas, knew firsthand all about mortality, pain, and the sad condition of human nature. You see how he was immediately transfixed and affected by his working environment. The interesting thing about that is if you look at the doctor's writings, a big part of his writings, particularly from 1847 onwards, he writes about the plight of human nature 
and the need for its complete transformation. In fact, his famous words were these, it is not a sin to be born a human being, it is a misfortune. So he was very much uh, affected by his working environment and by the times in which he lived. So he did get his uh, credentials, there's a copy of it there. Um, he was given the credentials and he was given a glowing report. Uh, Mr John Thomas evinced much talent and zeal in the duties he was called upon to discharge and that his industry and attention to the patients were universally acknowledged and approved. He discharged the duties of an officer of the office to the entire satisfaction of the professors and pupils and was awarded the St Thomas Hospital Prize for Proficiency, dated 4th of May 1832. What that's telling us <laughs> is he had extraordinary skills and extraordinary determination to succeed. And they were going to be great attributes that he could call upon in his study of God's word. And don't forget at this point in time, there's no interest in the religion at all, in, in the Bible whatsoever. Well, <clears throat> the future wasn't going to be in England because England was suffering badly at this point in time. In 1832, England had a lot of political unrest. There was the uh, Asiatic cholera was going through all the towns in London. There were people dying left, right and centre. There was filthy disease. The, the whole contaminated water system problem was occurring in the 1800s, particularly at that particular time because of untreated sewerage. The whole place was a mess. UK was not a place to live, but where it was, was the United States of America. The burgeoning place, the land of the free, the land and country of opportunity. And John Thomas's dad, wanted to give it a shot of preaching over there and John Thomas said, you know what, what a great idea, Dad. I'm going to go over there and I want to be a top-ranking surgeon. So uh, he, was, uh, he wanted to head for New York in search of becoming a renowned surgeon. Uh, he completed his study. He, uh, he was young, he was keen, he was excited, he was adventurous and he was very determined. Now, here's, a, here's an interesting point. And Pip, I always remember you giving a lecture on this between evolution and... and what the Bible really does teach and I thought it was very good and it, it's so true there were two men two men four years apart in age Dr Thomas being the older two men similar age left on a life changing voyage five months apart one of them of course was Dr Thomas and the other one was Charles Darwin one man would invent a theory that would, be, would destine mankind to turn their back on God. The other one would find and share a truth that would prove there is a God who was so passionately wanting to save mankind. Isn't that interesting? Two men diametrically opposed in their teachings and outcomes of their life. I mean, the sad thing about all that is that that man on the right, his theory would have the most profound negative effect on this particular world. Okay, let's jump on board the ship that he's going to go. We're going to, we're going to sail with him briefly. We're not going to drag this out, but it's really interesting because this is what is going to pave the way for next week's study on, on how he becomes interested in religion. He's going to jump on this ship here, the Marcus of Wellesley, 500-ton ship. He's going to jump on board with 89 passengers and, a few, and crew, so 89 in total. And he's going to head to New York. He's going to go alone. He's not bringing his dad and mum with him. They're going to stay for a little while and they're hopefully going to hear some sort of report from uh, John Thomas uh, and then they would make the, the, uh, the emigration across to America. He is recorded in the ship's register as being the medical attendant on board. So he's got 89 people to look after. He's the only medical attendant. This is not a modern day cruise ship. I mean... I wouldn't want to travel on that cruise ship across to New York, but I'd probably rather go on that than the Ruby Princess at the moment. But I tell you what, it is not a great ship. They head out and on board is this 27-year-old doctor who uh, is uh, going to sail out to 56 days of unimaginable terror. Right from the word go, it gets rough. 
56 days of the rolling rough seas and waves are going to pound over that boat and this one young man is in charge of 89 souls. Now, you get seasick, they tell me, I'm, I don't get seasick, but they tell me it's the worst sickness you can get. That'd be right, Matt, it's pretty bad. It's horrible, it is horrible. They go, you go green. There's no turning back. They, they've got a, they're making their way to New York and you've got 89 people on board. Obviously some of the crew wouldn't have ever got seasick, but the rest of them, could you imagine the doctor running around trying to look after all these people? What could he do? You can't alleviate seasickness. It's a terrible thing. So they leave uh, the, uh, the uh, port uh, in London there, the docks in London, St Catherine's Docks, and they make their way across to New York. They actually take exactly the same route as the Titanic. They almost end up same outcome as the Titanic. Now there's no Morse code, hadn't been invented, there's no radios, there's no means of, you know, just dialing up and calling out for help if you get into trouble. There's, there's no modern navigation equipment, no radars, nothing. And sure enough, the North Atlantic Sea serves up one of its greatest storms of that particular... And it's noted in the log books of the captain uh, on this particular ship. Um, and the Marquis of Wellesley is like a cork in the ocean. Or as Dr Thomas wrote, we were like a chip in a boiling cauldron for 56 days. <laughs> it's it's mind-blowing to think of that when you, you try and imagine being on board this, this ship. Well, the passengers insisted that uh, they needed to have some sort of religious service on board. They needed to, to um, have meetings of worship, hymns, prayers and Bible readings. Uh, and they wrote the doctor in on this. Doesn't believe at this stage, he's got no religious connotation at all. I'm not saying he didn't believe in God, but he's not connected to any religion. He's not spending time on religion, but they actually dragged the doctor in and say, you will read so-and-so. So he had to read a portion of scripture. And it did seem, as the doctor mentions, to calm the spirits of the passengers. They, they seem to be calm after doing this. So he's watching all this. He's looking at all this saying, what? What psychological things happening in the minds of these people that they read the Bible, they sing a few hymns and suddenly they feel a little bit better. So he's seeing all what's going on, he's taking it all in and they're heading in to dire trouble uh, simply because as they, uh, as they continue on, they're 250 miles off course, 400 k's off course and they ended up at the Sable Islands, they should have been well south of the Sable Islands. Sable Islands like a rocky little island with a lot of reefs that is known as the graveyard of the 18th century. There's hundreds of ships there and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lives had been lost in this particular area. Um, and you can't help but think of the Apostle Paul's journey a little bit here. Not that I'm trying to correlate this and it's a deliberate you know, connection between John Thomas and the Apostle Paul. but. It is quite interesting uh, that as they are going into this great storm, on more than two occasions, this young doctor actually warned the captain and the crew that he felt the ship was right off course. How did he know that? Well, apparently passing ships that were going the other way by their flags, you could tell where they were destined to be heading. And he added one and one and came up with two. The captain and the crew came up with three or four because they said, no, we're on, we're on we're on target, we're heading in the right direction. And he's thinking, no, that ship there's going there, so therefore we're not heading in the right direction. If we're passing, we shouldn't even be passing these ships. What's going on? Of course, they ended up being uh, off course and they ran aground on Sable Islands. Um, and this was uh, one of those, almost a comedy thing that takes place. And we've all heard this story. I, I really love this story because it's so true. Um, they ran aground, there's massive waves are pounding the stern of the ship, um, it's, uh, it's on the ground, every time a wave comes it's going up. The ship by the way was mostly timber, it was a sailing ship, but it did have a copper lined uh, hull which prevented the hull from breaking up. It didn't hit stone, it hit sand which was a very good thing. But every time the ship came up and came down again it absolutely shook the ship to its foundations. It was unbelievable. Well all of a sudden the doctor looks around, people are in absolute terror. They're, the mode of terror is, is everywhere. 
They're, they're, they're on their knees, praying to God. One man is yelling out, and this is the comedy part of the doctor. It was Whether it just happened at the spur of the moment, I don't know, but I laugh every time I think about it. You know, he was screaming out, we will all go to the bottom, we'll all go to the bottom. And he said, excuse me, sir, we're already on the bottom. We can't go any further. So it was quite interesting that the doctor remained calm to be able to make that comment. Um, it was all getting out of hand. A doctor was seeing a Catholic over there praying to God for help. He could see a Presbyterian over there praying to God for help. He could see a Calathumpian over there who doesn't know what he believes praying to God for help. And he's looking around. He's confused. He is totally confused because he sees that man who doesn't believe the same as that man who doesn't believe the same as that man is all praying to a God to help them. And so he makes this interesting com uh, this, uh, observation that somewhere around along the way there's something quite confusing and complex with what I'm viewing and, and seeing at the moment. So what he does, and I like to call this the Thomas promise, all right? He makes a promise about his search for the truth. He says... Oh, I don't want to be in a position where I'm confused as to what's going on and this is now a matter of life and death, he says. So he makes this promise. He says, if ever I get ashore again, I will never rest till I find out the truth of the matter that I might no more be found in such an uncertain state of mind. That's what he said. And the ship... After one more time of banging into that, it was righted and off it went, but it ran aground again and then it was lifted off with the waves and then finally after masts were broken, the thing, this, this sad, sorry ship finally limped into uh, New York. Eight weeks, completed a trip from London to New York, which it would normally take four weeks. The interesting thing too, he arrives there three days after Dr. Thomas arrives in New York. His dad knocks on the door. His father actually left three weeks. He couldn't wait any longer for any news from, from Dr. Thomas. And, and he opens the door and says, Dad, what are you doing? He said, well, I couldn't wait anymore. He left three weeks after Dr. Thomas left, and he got there only three days after Dr. Thomas arrived. So the determination of Dr. Thomas was now set in stone. He had made a promise. He says, I don't want to be found in a state of confusion anymore. I want to search out the matter for myself to see what this Bible really does teach. So I'm never found in any uncertainty. And he made this a little later on, this comment. He says, if I'm wrong, I'm going to get it right. When I get it right, I'm going to defend the right, maintain the right, and overthrow the wrong or perish in the attempt. And he stuck to that. He stuck to that comment that he would find out what this Bible is all about. He would check it out from cover to cover to make sure that whatever he finally realised was the truth was the truth and he would protect it come what may. Well, of course, he still knows nothing about the Bible. He's been making these comments. He's been making these vows, these promises. He still has not got any idea about the Bible until he reaches, comes in contact with this man here. Alexander Campbell. The doctor was 27 years old. Alexander Campbell was 44 years old. And to say that the doctor was overawed with the charisma of this man and his supposed knowledge of the Bible was an absolute understatement. The doctor was enamoured by him. He was absolutely floored by this man and his ability to be able to speak on the Bible. And thus began a seven-year connection with the Campbellites. Keep this very brief because I'm going to end in, this, in a moment. But I just want to say this, that as soon as they got to New York, they settled their affairs, they did everything they, good, they, they could to get ready for a life in America. And they knew New York wasn't going to be the place to be, so they set off to Cincinnati, Ohio for their first taste of America. And they headed up there and Dr Thomas runs into this Campbellite he was one of the followers of Alexander the Campbell, caught up the chain of command of the Campbellites, if you like, and he bumps into him and he spends time with him discussing the truth, or not the truth, I shouldn't use those terms, discussing the Bible. Um, 
His father is also there. He's landed a job as a Baptist preacher in Cincinnati. The doctor is getting a little bit of work in the surgery. Uh, he's having some meetings with, doctor, with Daniel Gaino uh, and he is finally baptised into the Campbellites. So there was a few days of persuasive speech by Dr Gaino, uh, sorry, by Daniel Gaino and Dr Thomas after uh, three hours of formal chat, so that's like your, your interview, uh, with Major Daniel Gaino, Campbellite. Dr Thomas is baptised on a very cold 12 degree Sunday evening, 14th of October 1832 at 7.30pm in the Miami Canal in Cincinnati. Freezing cold, baptised, now becomes an official Campbellite and his expression was, I have um, felt, I feel liberated in knowing what the Bible teaches after just a few short conversations with this man. Little did he realise it was going to be another 15 years before he would finally realise what the truth was all about. There's the uh, premises of Alexander Campbell, still there today. Life in Ohio didn't go to plan. Four months they felt compelled they had to move to the eastern states for work. Um, his father went with him. Uh, the doctor's uh, uh, case was also that such that he wanted to further his scriptural knowledge and he was convinced by Daniel Gaino to stay in Alexander Campbell's house. And he did. There it is today. You actually go there, Alexander Campbell's house has been restored and it's like a, you can go for a tour through it like a museum. It's quite probable that little section there on the end of the main residing, residence of the house is where Dr Thomas actually stayed. He stopped there for a month. He lived there for one month in April 1833 and that's where he gave his first public lecture on Daniel chapter 2. Wouldn't you love to get those notes? Wouldn't that be fantastic to see what he said? Daniel chapter 2 he spoke on. Now I'll leave you with these thoughts here. This is the connection that Don, uh, John Thomas had with Alexander Campbell. This is what he said about the man at this stage in his life. He said, our visits to Bethany, that's where um, in, in Pennsylvania this was, uh, where uh, Alexander Campbell lived, our visits to Bethany excited in our hearts a friendship for him, for Alexander Campbell, which we exceedingly regret should have terminated so unpropitiously. So he's writing this after he's separated from Campbell. Look at this next statement. For Mr Campbell, we would have laid down our life if called upon. So I want you to leave you with that point of how closely connected John Thomas is with Alexander Campbell. They were inseparable at this point in their life. But sadly, things go very sour, very south, very quickly.